Oh, hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of our Berean Bible study at our Bible Basics series. And I'm your host, Granville McKenzie, and glad to be together for another time together with the Word of God. And so tonight we're going to begin at uh, Deuteronomy chapter 11. So please uh, turn to that uh, chapter. We will begin, as usual, with prayer, and then we will jump in with any questions you may have had from last time, and then uh, we'll be into Deuteronomy 11. And Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you for your blessings, your goodness, your mercy, your grace. Thank you for your love that is abundant toward us, and we pray and ask today that you would be with us as we spend time together in your word. I pray that you will open our hearts and understanding, as always, that we can learn of you. We bless you. Thank you for each one who has joined me tonight, and I pray your blessing will be upon every household, every individual, all who are taking time now to uh, devote this time to you. And we bless you and give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So another good day together around the Word of God. If there's anything that you may be uh, thinking about from last time that you'd like to chat about, this is your opportunity. And for those who have just jumped on, we'll be starting at Deuteronomy chapter 11 tonight. So I will just uh, take a look if I see any hands for last week's um, questions, and we will just jump right in. Okay, so I don't see any hands up just now. So let's proceed to Deuteronomy 11. And as we have been doing, and because, of course, we studied Deuteronomy in great detail not too long ago, I would just like to hit sort of the points of, of each of these chapters, <clears throat> and as you realize, the chapter headings were, were done by some editor, uh, redactor later down the road. Um, initially, this was just one speech, but I think we can see fairly clearly from the divisions in the text that uh, what the editors were thinking when they put the chapter headings where they did. And so this uh, particular section in chapter 11, the first seven verses really talked about, talk to us about a constant theme throughout the book of Deuteronomy, which is obedience, obedience to God and his word. So it says, you shall therefore love the Lord your God, and always keep his charge, his statutes, his ordinances, and his commandments. He goes on, of course, to speak about the fact that uh, we do this because we, uh, you know, they came out of Egypt, they saw all that God had done at that time, and because of that, verse 7 says, your own eyes have seen all the great work of the Lord, which he did. So we should therefore love the Lord, keep his commandments and his statutes, because uh, in, in this case, he said, your eyes have seen all the great work of the Lord, which he did. The contemporary application, I think, is fairly easy to ascertain. Um, God has done great things for us as we we read in the Psalms, the Lord has done great things for me, whereof I am glad. And it is important for us to constantly bring back to our memories what the Lord has done for us and not allow them to slip into oblivion and uh, make sure that because of that, we continue to obey the Lord, his commandments, as we know we should. The um, next part of the, well, uh, the, the rest of the chapter actually 
uh, highlights this particular theme. And so you will see in verse 13, uh, at the end of the verse, it says, you keep his commandments to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and all your soul. So it now gets beyond the fact that we uh, serve him and obey him just by rote, shall we say, and it gets to the heart of it. We do this because it really is in our heart and in our soul. And it's because of love. Love the Lord, serve him with all your heart and soul. Down in verse 22, it says, for if you are careful to keep all this commandment, which I'm commanding you to do, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and hold fast to him, then the Lord will drive out all these nations from before you and you will dispossess nations greater and mightier than you. So that's the theme of chapter 11. Know the commandments, keep them. You have seen what God has done already, and he really wants us to serve him with a pure heart and a heart of love. Okay, uh, it's a quick run through chapter 11. Any thoughts there? Of course, as always, if something to mind as we go ahead, uh, then please just feel free to interrupt me at whatever moment that may be. So chapter 12 um, starts with an injunction, uh, again, to keep the statutes and the judgments and to get rid of every vestige of idolatry. Uh, verse 2, chap uh, Deuteronomy 12 and 2, utterly destroy all the places where the nations whom you shall dispossess serve their gods and tear down the altars, smash their sacred pillars, burn their ashram with fire, and cut down and anything to do with their worship, uh, you get rid of that. And then verse 5 says, but you shall seek the Lord at the place which the Lord your God will choose from all your tribes to establish his name there for his dwelling, and there you shall come. There you shall bring your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, the contribution of your hand, your votive offerings, your free will offerings, the firstborn of your herd and of your flock. And uh, verse 7 is, is good. Halfway through, rejoice in all your undertakings in which the Lord your God has blessed you. So we get rid of every vestige of idolatry. And this speaks to us about the centrality of the house of God. Uh, we recontextualize that into our uh, modern time. We do not uh, neglect the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. But it is very important that we continue to come to the house of the Lord and to, uh, to the place that has been chosen as a place for his name to dwell. And, and so this, this thought now in verse 7, to rejoice in his presence, rejoice in our undertakings, that shows up again in verse 12. It says Deuteron Deuteronomy 12, 12, you shall rejoice before the Lord your God. Uh, down in verse 18, at the end of the verse, you shall rejoice before the Lord your God in all your undertakings. So as we go through life, there are things our hands find to do. Of course, scripture tells us we should do it with our might. And we need to come before the Lord with rejoicing, do everything heartily as unto the Lord and rejoice uh, for the privilege we have of coming to his house and being able to serve him with gladness and all the other things that we read in, in the Psalms. So <clears throat> other places, of course. So, so that's the, the major portion of chapter 11. And then uh, toward the latter end of that 
a chapter in chapter 12 we have some uh, instructions as far as uh, as far as coming with our offerings coming with thanksgiving and it gave them of course the uh, way in which they would handle travel if they had to travel a long way with the first fruit of their herd the first fruit of the flock uh, their tithes or offerings they would come with uh, those to the temple or uh, just come on their own and buy them when they got there. But these are things that they would need to do to come and show their appreciation to the Lord. And of course, uh, very clearly obey his word and his instructions with regard to their worship in, in the, uh, at the tabernacle. We'll come back to that in a later chapter. So I won't. I won't uh, say much more about that now. And then we get to chapter 13, and we have a continuation again of this whole thing of staying away from idolatry, staying away from those who, who would actually uh, come with signs and wonders and, and dreaming dreams and all of this and at the same time, turning people away from the Lord. So the Lord said, don't listen to that prophet, whether they have dreams, visions, signs, wonders, and these things come to pass. If they are turning you away from God, then the Lord said, these people have just come to test you. Uh, we, we understand that God allows tests to come in our lives and he sees clearly and knows what we're all about but i always think of these tests as ways for us to see ourselves see where we are see what kind of lives we are living uh, before god and come to an understanding of how we need to pull up our socks and stay away from anything that smacks of idolatry so we follow the lord 13 4 uh, fear him keep his commandments listen to his voice serve him and cling to him so a recurring theme of course as we have seen in that um in in deuteronomy and of course false prophets they would put to death um then we go to verse 6 and and following even if this false prophet and this dreamer is a part of your own family they have to be dealt with in the same way there's no exception they will be stoned and that's that's of course a, a quite standard old testament um punishment i i was reading just the other day it was actually quite interesting i was wondering how how did they in fact uh, do this and and so uh, what they would do they would have a platform that they would use for this purpose that would be probably um, about 10 feet high and they would drop the person off this platform quite often on their head and that should be enough to kill them if not they would finish them off with with uh, heavy stones um, mainly to the chest area to uh, crush their chest and uh, uh, they wouldn't be able to breathe etc so this uh, is a gruesome detail that you may not have been all that interested in but stoning was not a matter of starting with you know uh, whatever rocks you would find nearby they would actually drop them off a platform which should um, at least knock them unconscious if not kill them outright and whatever needed to be done after that they would do with with heavy stones this was the punishment for those 
who were trying to turn people away from God. And so that is the real uh, message of chapter 13. So I'll just continue until I see a hand or a question um, that you may raise. Uh, so we get into chapter 14, and now we get back into dietary laws, some of which we have already seen in Exodus and uh, Leviticus. As you see, these, these books of the Pentateuch are really going through uh, apart from Genesis, but uh, from Exodus, when Moses really started to get this download from God as to the, the laws and rules and regulations the people should follow, you see that there's a, a repetition of this in the following books that he wrote, Deuteronomy being the second law. He is now doing this for the generation that had just come up and but, but whether it was instructions to the priests in Leviticus or to the uh, people here in Deuteronomy, there is this repetition um, of the law. Animals that are clean, animals that are unclean, you are free to uh, read through that at your leisure. Down in verse uh, 22, uh, it really, it, it starts to talk now about tithing, tithing the produce of what uh, people would sow. And then there was the, the whole thing of coming into the tabernacle with this tithe of, of grain, a tithe of oil, tithe of wine, and of course, the uh, firstborn of their flock and herd, uh, the herd being cattle, the flock being sheep and goats. You would have these people come, and this, of course, was a big part of what the priests and Levites would eat. And so they would come with this tithe. And so starting in verse 22, you will see that. And, of course, in the feasts that Israel would celebrate, they would bring offerings from, from the field, from the herd, from the flock, and they would eat and rejoice before the Lord. And, and so even in this tithing, it was not just a matter of giving to the Lord, but in fact, there was a, a, an enjoyment uh, from the, the feast that they would have of what the Lord had blessed them with, and they would come and spend this time together. And then you get down to 1428, uh, you you see that uh, there is well I should jump I should start from 26 when they would come for these feasts they said look spend your money on whatever your heart desires oxen sheep or wine or strong drink whatever your heart desires uh, you eat that in the presence of the Lord and rejoice you and your household and again keep in mind uh, this is not uh, uh, telling us to, to go out and uh, drink a lot of wine and strong drink. Everything, of course, they should do without getting into the bad side, drunkenness and all of that. But it is uh, the way that they would come and celebrate before the Lord. And this was um, sanctioned by God through Moses. Then in verse 28, every third year they would bring a tithe, another tithe of their produce in that year and in their towns they would give it to the levite because the levites had no uh, portion and inheritance strangers or aliens or orphans widows those who were poor in the town they would now come and have this this um, opportunity to be blessed by the food that would be provided. Now, it doesn't specify here, but I'm assuming that, that people would be coming, their three-year period 
my, you know, mine might be this year, yours might be next year, someone else's the year after. So year by year, there would be a constant flow. But this was a responsibility for each individual. Uh, every third year, they would bring this extra tithe. And so there was um, a tithe that was brought to the priests. Um, this, this tithe would also cover their their feasts and their celebrations there's another tithe now every three years that would be for the benefit of the poor so that is chapter 14 anything on anybody's mind again i'm just touching on the high points of these chapters just to make sure we we don't miss the the main things that they're talking about now chapter 15 uh, gets into the sabbatical year so we have the sabbath day every week and then as far as years go every seventh year would be a sabbatic year for the land no crops would be growing again depending on when people started their cycle on their land uh, their land could be uh, you know portions uh, that would be on sabbath but what they would typically do would be to divide their fields into seven portions and so <clears throat> one portion would be uh, on sabbath and sort of six sevenths of their land would be available year by year <clears throat> someone certainly could uh, just have their whole field and lie barren for the year but many of them just did this uh, circle uh, by dividing up the land so that they they wouldn't be sitting doing nothing for a year but the land right from year one a portion would be on sabbath and they would just cycle through the um the fields uh, and six of the seven would be available for each year now uh, along with this comes the remission of debt if people had uh, borrowed money from their neighbors uh, this would be repaid now, I, I don't know if you're seeing what I'm seeing on my screen. I have an LED bulb here, and these little bars just keep floating up. I, I hope it's not um, um, too distracting, but um, I really don't have another bulb to change it to just now. So um, I'll have to deal with that before next week. I um, hope it's not too distracting for anybody. Um, debts would be forgiven in the end of the at the end of the seventh year and and so God said now I want you to understand how to think about um, about this in in verse four he said hey even though you are forgiving this debt verse four there will be no poor among you since the Lord will surely bless you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance to possess. If only you listen obediently to the voice of the Lord your God, who observe carefully all this commandment which I'm commanding you today. So it sounds like you're going to be giving up a lot, but I'm telling you, you will be blessed. So don't think that being gracious and kind to the poor is going to make you poor. Um, and then we get to verse 7 um, to say, don't harden your heart against the, the one who needs a loan. Um, if there's a poor man with you, one of your brothers in any of your towns, you shall not harden your heart nor close your hand from your poor brother but you shall freely open your hand to him 
and shall generously lend him sufficient for his need in whatever he lacks. Now, well, let me continue to verse 9. Be, beware that there is no base thought in your heart saying, the seventh year, the year of remission, is near, and your eye is hostile toward your poor brother, and you give him nothing. Then he may cry to the Lord against you, and it will be a sin for you. You shall generously give to him, and your heart shall not be grieved when you give to him, because for this thing the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in all your undertakings. The poor will never cease to be in the land. Therefore, I command you, saying, you shall freely open your hand to your brother, to your needy and poor in your land. So now we, you know, this certainly brings up the whole thing of, of borrowing and lending. We already are aware of the principle that, that God would make his people lenders and not borrowers. And, and so there's a blessing that God promised to his people Israel. And, and he said, now, I want you to lend with a pure heart on the basis of the need of your brother or sister who is poor and don't withhold what they need. Obviously, if, it, if it's in our power to give. So it's not a matter that, number one, you throw your money away and people say, oh, you know, can I borrow whatever? Um, it, it speaks here about the poor and it speaks about meeting their needs. And it speaks about being generous to them, even though, you know, this is year six, next year's a Sabbath year, and, and I'm going to lose all of this. The Lord is saying, I will bless you for your generosity and your lending. And don't, don't take that to heart. There will always be poor people. There will always be those in need. And I think, again, from a practical standpoint, we do need to understand that God is not telling us to be foolish. Um, uh, in some places in, in Proverbs, for instance, he'll talk about not um, co-signing if you don't have the money, not co-signing for someone's loan um, when you don't have the money to pay. So it's a matter of, of lending if you are able and being generous as you are able and trusting that God will fulfill his word to replenish your stock and of course there are those who will say well this was specifically to israel and and this is not just a general rule in 2022 for the church and i acknowledge the fact that this is written to israel i'm not going to argue that i think what we want to do is to to glean from this the principle of generosity the principle that we should do what is in our power to do to help those who are in need and not be um, selfish in keeping all we have for ourselves when we see our brother or sister in need. Um, so that's the first part of chapter 15, the whole law of... of um, Sabbaths for the land, uh, the remission or the forgiveness of debt after seven years. And then verse 12 and on goes on to talk about the, well, 12 to 17, really, 12 to 18. You now have another situation. You could come to the end of seven years. Someone had sold himself or herself to you as your slave, a Hebrew, uh, one of your brethren, and they will serve six years, but in the seventh year, they go free. That's verse 12. And verse 13, when you set them free, don't send them away 
empty handed, but give them what they need to be able to sustain themselves. You certainly can think of the fact that if someone was in such a condition that they had to sell themselves as a slave, they had nothing. And so now the scripture is telling us what, what Israel had to do was to um, let them go in the seventh year and at the same time bless them and make sure that they uh, would not leave empty handed, give them something to get started up with uh, again. Now, there are those in verse 16, they would say, hey, I like it here. Uh, I'm doing well with you as, as my master. And so I want to stay. And uh, now let me just add a little something to this um, that is mentioned in Exodus 21, uh, verses 5 and 6. The, the law was that if you sold yourself as a slave and the master gave you a wife, the wife belongs to the master. Just because you married her, she doesn't belong to you. She belongs to the master. And if you have children, you are a slave to the master. Your wife is a slave to the master. Your children are born slaves to, to the master. So if your seventh year comes along and it's time that you can be released, well, you would leave behind your wife and your children because those were gifts to you from the master. But you can decide to stay because of your wife and children. Uh, Exodus 21. Exodus 21, I think we should, shall say, we'll start at verse um, 2, which just repeats what we have just read. Exodus 21, 2, if you buy a Hebrew slave, he shall serve for six years, but on the seventh, he shall go out as a free man without payment. If he comes alone, he shall go out alone. If he is the husband of a wife, then his wife shall go out with him. So if you and your wife um, sold yourselves as slaves, both of you are released together. Verse 4, but if the master gives him a wife and she bears him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall belong to her master and he shall go out alone. So you come in married, you'll leave married. You uh, come in single and you're given a wife and you have children, they belong to the master. Point, Exodus 21.5, but if the slave plainly says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out as a free man, then his master shall bring him to God, and bringing him to God basically means taking him to the gate of the city where the elders would sit and transact business. And he shall bring him to the door or the doorpost and his master uh, shall pierce his ear with an awl and he shall serve him permanently. And so back to uh, Exodus 15, uh, it only mentions him loving his master but Exodus gives us, uh, Deuteronomy 15, I think I said Exodus, Deuteronomy 15, uh, when we come back to that, we see that, that um, it only mentions loving his master, I won't go out from you in 15, 16, because he loves you and your household, uh, since he fares well with you, there's sometimes more to it than that, in that he had a wife and children he loved and he would stay. Uh, same thing here as is mentioned in Exodus 21. They would take him to the door doorpost, uh, pierce his ear through, and literally nail it, nail him to the door, nail him to the doorpost, and he would be a slave forever in that household. Okay. 
Now, uh, verse 19 uh, to the end really just speaks again of the redemption of the firstborn, uh, the firstborn of uh, all males that are born in your herd and in your flock, and those are given to God. So that is chapter 15, sabbatical year, some laws for the slaves at the end of their sabbatical period of slavery, and, um, and then just the consecration of the firstborn males to the Lord. Okay, so anything there that you would like to talk about? Okay. Moving right along, we will go to chapter 16. And chapter 16 is basically a repeat of Exodus 23, when Moses first introduced these uh, three times a year that all males uh, had to appear before God. Leviticus 23 gives us uh, a similar rendition of that law. Numbers 28 and 29 give us a repeat of that. So this is now the fourth time that we see this coming up in the, the Pentateuch. And of course, Genesis was before uh, the time of, of law. So, so basically, in all of these books that were written uh, after Sinai, Moses, at or after Sinai, Moses brings these feasts into play. These were very important times when people would come before God uh, with their tithes, with their, uh, many times they'd bring offerings, thanksgiving offerings, peace offerings, whatever the case may be. Those could be brought at any time, but this was a time of rejoicing. It was a time of sharing. It was a time of uh, taking care of the poor and needy. All of these things were contemplated in these feasts. It was a time of remembrance, Passover, of course, God's deliverance from um, uh, Egypt. Uh, then you have the Feast of First Fruits, and this is just thanking God and offering to Him the first fruits of the land every year. Uh, we have the Feast of Booths, uh, the, the Feast of um, that, that celebrated or commemorated the fact that Israel lived in tents, lived in temporary settings all the way through the wilderness. As we read a couple of weeks back, it was, what, 41 stops that they had between Ramses in Egypt and Jericho in Canaan. And so they would live in these booths and remember what God had done for them, remember that they had been slaves, and remember how God, by his mighty hand, had delivered them from Pharaoh and his army. So. So again, chapter 16, I won't go through in any more uh, detail because we have covered this uh, three other times uh, to this point. So then we come to chapter 17, which really speaks to us about the administration of justice in Israel. So uh, the, the essential thing is, in verse 6, this is uh, Deuteronomy 17, 6, uh, when someone is, is brought before the, the court, usually, again, at the gate of the temple, the elders would be there, and they would set up shop there because that was at once the most vulnerable part of the city and the most watched and protected part of the city. The army would be there, uh, or whatever guards they had that were uh, watching over the city, they would be at the gate allowing people 
uh, in and out. There were the wise judges there who would adjudicate cases. Um, real estate would be done there. You think of Boaz as he was uh, doing the deal to, to get Ruth. Um, and uh, trade happened there. Of course, traders would come to the gate so they'd have access to the city or do business outside of the gate and those inside would come and and do business with them so so everything all the important things politics would take place there um judgment all of that so on the evidence this is 176 on the evidence of two witnesses or three witnesses he who is to die shall be put to death he shall not be put to death on the evidence of one witness. And so this is a principle. And of course, even when it comes to prophetic words and things that we need to be concerned with in dealing with gifts of the Spirit, um, these, uh, these, I want to say gifts of the Spirit, uh, in the in the mouth of two or three witnesses of prophets are giving their prophecies uh they need to be corroborated if someone gives you a prophetic word uh, you are well within bounds to say yes lord i've heard you but i'm going to wait until i have a confirmation of this word by two uh at one or two other witnesses and so uh, that's how there they would adjudicate these cases so that no one would be put to death just because somebody uh, didn't like them and decided to frame them or do whatever okay so then we um the latter part of the uh, chapter yes we we want to talk about this um in verse i think we will start at verse 14 17 and 14 when you enter the land which the lord your god gives you and you possess it and live in it and you say i will set a king over me like all the nations who are around me you shall surely set a king over you whom the lord your god chooses one from among your countrymen you shall set as king over yourselves you may not put a foreigner over yourselves who is not your countryman so this had to be someone born in uh, israel and uh, in a country like canada anyone can become prime minister in the united states and well there are likely other places of, with a similar strategy you have to be born in the u.s to be eligible to become uh, president of the u.s you can be a foreign-born governor like uh, schwarzenegger was but to be the president you have to be born in america and of course that's one of the things that was brought up prominently by some of the opponents of uh, Barack Obama uh, trying to specify and uh, cast doubt on the fact that he had been born an American. Anyway, uh, in Israel, you had to be from the nation. Uh, verse 16, 17, 16 says, this is not about acquiring wealth for yourself, multiplying horses. Uh, certainly, he is not um, going to cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. You, you should never, you shall never, ever again go that way. Uh, Egypt was famous for its, its great horses. The Lord said, you're out of Egypt. You stay out of Egypt. You are not going back there. No way, no how. And, and so... Uh, when he got on the throne, in verse 18, now it shall come when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself a copy of this law on a scroll. 
in the presence of the Levitical priests. It shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by carefully observing all the words of this law and these statutes, that his heart may not be lifted up above his countrymen, and that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right or the left, so that he and his sons may continue king in his kingdom in the midst of Israel. So this book of the law that Moses had written, uh, they, anyone who ascended to the throne, needed to sit before the Levites, who I guess would monitor and, and make sure that this was done and done completely. The king would now have to write out this law on a scroll, and that would fix it firmly in his mind. But it's not a one-time thing, because if there was a king who had a brain like mine, I certainly don't have everything fixed after one reading. So what does it say? Um, this copy of the law from verse 18, verse 19 says, it shall be with him and he shall read it all the days of his life. And so it, it, it's, it's to be with him. I don't know how big these scrolls were. I... I imagine from every scroll I've ever seen, they're pretty hefty. And Moses was saying, write the scroll, whether I'm presuming in his entourage, someone had a copy of this uh, scroll and the king was to read it every day and observe the laws of God and of this uh, laws of God and his statutes, so that, in verse 20, his heart would not be lifted up above his countrymen. And, and so uh, this, was, uh, this was a matter of, of letting them understand that although they were kings, they were still to maintain a humble attitude. In fact, you, you can think of Jesus uh, in the triumphal entry into uh, Jerusalem, that uh, he he came in riding on a, a donkey, and that's what the kings would do as they were being inaugurated. They would ride on a donkey, not some big steed, but a donkey, a sign of humility, and and this was to be a part of the king's uh, mental, spiritual arsenal. So that is chapter 17. You guys are very quiet today. I think I need to wait for somebody to make a comment or say something to me. So I'm not, I can see you all there, but I'm the only one talking. Anybody have anything? Brother Owen, go ahead. Praise the Lord. I, I think it's verse. 14, I think it is. Yeah, verse 14 of chapter 17. Yep. Just noticing it says here, I uh, <clears throat> let me read the verse. It says, uh, when thou art come uh, unto the land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shall possess it, and shall dwell therein, and shall say, I will set a king over me, like as the other nations that are about me. So it takes me back to um, Samuel where, where they, they, they end up choosing a king. In other words, like the Lord has prophesied that they would do this? Absolutely. Uh, and oh. uh, thank you very much for bringing that up because I had that in my notes and I didn't, uh, uh, didn't read it. Now, that is absolutely the case. I was uh, rereading this, and I don't even remember uh, talking about this in detail when we went through Deuteronomy before. It's like, whoa, I hadn't, hadn't noticed that before, that, that God prophesied. says, I, I know you people. <laughs> you know, you're going to see all the nations around you, and they have a king, and I won't be good enough for you. So you're, you're going to... Um, 
uh, ask for a king. And, and so you shall surely set a king over you. And God said, I'm, I'm going to get involved. You uh, set the king over you whom the Lord your God chooses. And um, I talked about them being from the land. But God said, yeah, I will get involved in this. I know this is what you're going to do. So that prophecy was here, however many years it was uh, until, until uh, Samuel came along. And, and when the people came with this request, I guess Samuel wasn't really thinking back to this prophecy. And he's trying to talk the people out of it. And God says, hey, Samuel, just... Um, there's a guy named Saul, go anoint him, he'll be their king. And he said, and by the way, um, they're not rejecting you, Samuel, they're rejecting me. So don't get all uh, taking this personally. This is against me, it's not against you. Um, but if you go back to Deuteronomy, Samuel, you'll see that I told them they're going to choose a king. And so or they'll desire a king, and I will place kings over them. So, yeah, that's a very good point. Thanks for bringing that up. All right, anything on anybody else's mind? In which case, we will proceed to chapter 18. Um, now, Again, this, uh, this, this speaks about, uh, let me jump down to verse 9, where it speaks about divination, soothsaying, you know, all that sort of thing, that this cannot be a part of, of Israel's modus operandi. Uh, anybody who is of this ilk, whether it's your own son or daughter, as we read previously, this has to be stopped. Um, there were people who were literally burning their children. Molech was the, the god that was uh, famous for this, the worship of Molech. And, and he would have his arms open. If you uh, see a picture of him on the internet, um, sitting with his arms open, and and they would literally bring their their uh, young children to him, and on his arms uh, it was like furnaces in his arms, and they'd place them in his arms and roast their own children. Uh, this is described as detestable to the Lord in eighteen twelve. And because of these detestable things, the Lord, your God, will drive them out before you. So divination, witchcraft, uh, omens, uh, sorcery, casting spells, mediums, spiritists, those who call up the dead, uh, that's verse, verses 10 and 11, all of this was not to be seen heard or spoken of in israel uh, verse 14 18 14 for those nations which you shall dispossess uh, listen uh, am i reading this correctly for those nations which you shall dispossess listen to those who practice uh, witchcraft uh, and to diviners but as for you the lord god has not allowed you to do so these people you're dispossessing they listen to these these diviners and witches and all of that but not you do not go into that and then he jumps right into another prophetic word and moses does here in 1815 the lord your god will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you from your countrymen, you shall listen to him. Uh, this is, uh, let me just uh, jump down to verse 18, uh, 17, I should say. Moses makes it clear that he is repeating what God had said to him. The Lord said to me, you have spoken well. 
I will raise up a prophet from among your countrymen like you, and I will put my words in his mouth, and she, he shall uh, speak to them all that I command him. It shall come about that whoever will not listen to my words, which he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. And uh, so there, there, is, there is a prophecy here that might not seem, you know, totally clear and, and easy to understand. But uh, I will just uh, mention one particular scripture right now, which is in Acts chapter 3. Acts 3, 22 and 23. So what, what happens at times is that there is, um, there are interpretations of Old Testament scriptures in the New Testament and as these apostles whom God uh, called, appointed, anointed, bring forth these interpretations, we can accept these as valid, anointed, and godly because of the role that these apostles played. And, and of course, they represent, uh, represented Christ while they were on earth as the ones who had been painstakingly taught, trained, and developed by none other than Jesus himself. And so uh, Acts chapter 3, that was just to give you a little time to, to turn, and verse 22, uh, this, this is Peter's sermon after the lame man was healed at the beautiful gate of the temple. So, of course, people wanted to know what was going on, and Peter stood up to preach. And, and so, of course, uh, if you look at Peter, Peter's preaching, he basically has one message, um, faith in Christ uh, through his death, burial, and resurrection. And, but he, he inserts this in Acts 3.22. Moses said, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet, uh, like uh, a prophet like me, from your brethren. To him you shall give heed to everything he says to you, and it will be well, uh, and it will be that every soul that does not heed that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. So this, this is, oh. I should have I should have gone back to verse uh, verse nineteen. You you can read the whole thing, but verse nineteen says, "Therefore repent and return, so that your sins may be wiped away, in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that He may send Jesus, the Christ appointed for you, whom heaven must receive." until the period of restoration of all things and uh, things that God spoke through the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient time. Moses said, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet, as I, I read previously. So this is the most uh, direct prophecy and fulfillment motif of this of this particular prophecy of Moses in Deuteronomy 18, 15. There, um, some of you are quite familiar with this, but there are a couple of um, types of uh, interpretation of prophecy and explanation of prophecy that, that we see. One is called Midrash in, in Hebrew. And a midrash is basically um, it can sort of mean whatever you want it to mean. You might be able to find some way of sort of molding the scripture 
to say what you want it to say. And, and uh, a lot of time would be spent by the rabbis just sort of massaging scripture to get it to say what they wanted it to say. Um, we would use the term in our day, uh, eisegesis, reading something into scripture. But there's another kind of um, interpretive uh, model that they would use or, or word they would use, which is called pesher, P-E-S-H-E-R. And pesher is, is sort of the this is that kind of prophecy. So like Peter saying on the day of Pentecost, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and he says in the last day, says, God, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall see um, uh, visions. Your, your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. Um, that is, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. So here Peter continues, this is that which was spoken by Moses. This Jesus, the Christ, who you see, is none other than the prophet who Moses spoke about. So we can tie these together. Um, certainly, if you go back into Luke, for instance, um, Luke 24, uh, you, you see Jesus coming into, the tent, uh, into a Jerusalem, riding on a donkey, and and again the explanation is this is what isaiah you know, was speaking about and and so we we pull these into the new testament as jesus and the apostles give us the the pesher exegesis um you know and and the understanding of this means that so uh, moses is saying now, let me flip back to um, Deuteronomy now. Moses is saying, stay away from spiritists and witches and necromancers and diviners and um, anyone who casts a spell or a medium or anyone who calls up the dead. You stay far from them. But there's a prophet coming that you will need to listen to. He is coming in the spirit of Moses. Moses is described in one scripture as the meekest man who ever lived. Uh, from whence we get things like gentle Jesus, meek and mild, look upon your little child. Um, Moses, for understanding the fact that there were times he would have fits of rage and anger, for the most part, he he was the most humble man on earth and jesus came in that mold and jesus as as moses delivered the law to the people jesus also delivered the law but an interpreted version you have heard it said um thou shalt not kill well i'm telling you don't say certain words against your brother uh, that is tantamount to killing him um, you have heard it said thou shalt not commit adultery but the pressure uh, to that is a saying no but i'm telling you the true meaning of this don't look at a woman with lust that is the same as um, committing adultery with her so don't listen to the bad Listen to this prophet, Moses said, who is going to come after me. So that's chapter 18. Uh, chapter uh, 18, yes. Okay. Don't see any hands raised. Anybody have anything on your mind? Another open door for comment or question. All right, so we carry on to chapter 19. Um, again, I'm not going to 
take long here because we have gone through this in the book of Leviticus, where we see the cities of refuge spoken of and what, what happens. These, these cities were to be accessible to anyone who had committed manslaughter. And manslaughter, of course, by its very nature, is, is not premeditated. And so still, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, if you killed someone's relative, then they could come after you. So God established the fact that there are places you can go where you can be safe and uh, you can have your day in court, you can explain yourself, and uh, if it's determined that you killed someone unintentionally, uh, here's how you deal with that. You go to a city of refuge and you stay there and don't leave until the current serving high priest dies. When that high priest dies, you're free to go, and the avenger of blood uh, can't, uh, no longer has any power over you. <clears throat> so, so that is um, the first part of chapter 19. And then, of course, it continues in verse 15, where it says, a single witness shall not rise up against a man on account of any iniqu iniquity or any sin which he has committed. On the evidence of two or three witnesses, a matter shall be confirmed. Um, and then it goes on to say, yes, we understand there could be um, a malicious witness, or even as we saw in the case of Jesus, a number of false witnesses that rose up against him. Yes, there could still be abuses, but this is how the law should be handled and how people who have offended and broken the law should be handled. So those are the, the uh, two main points in chapter 19. Uh, run to the city of refuge if you need to, and you won't be killed unless there are two or three witnesses to testify against you. And uh, we keep those rules and laws in mind. Well, certainly Israel did. Chapter 19, any thoughts? Okay, so we move on to chapter 20. And we see here uh, what would happen if Israel was going to battle against their enemies. Um, first, he says in verse 3, Here, O Israel, you are approaching the battle against your enemies today. Do not be faint-hearted. Do not be afraid or panic or tremble before them. Why? For, this is 20 verse 4, uh, For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you, to fight for you against your enemies to save you. So war will come, battles will arise, and I think this is uh, certainly an Old Testament principle we can bring across and apply to our own lives to understand that we don't need to fear any spiritual battle that we will come up against and no one is able to pluck us out of our father's hand no one is able to touch us without um, the direct permission of of god and you know, of course that's even in the old testament with people like job we see that concept at work uh, so when we go into battle Battle means we're going to have to fight. <laughs> Battle means there are things that are going to be tough that come into our lives. But we do not go into the battle with fear or panic or trembling because we know the Lord our God is the one who fights for us. And so that 
should give us great um, comfort in our hearts as we go through lives. However, uh, verse 5, the officers shall speak to the people saying, who is the man that has built a new house and has not dedicated it? Let him depart and return to his house. Otherwise, he might die in the battle and another man would dedicate it or take it as his own. Um, verse 6, who is the man that has planted a vineyard and has not begun to use its fruit? Uh, let him depart and return to his house. Otherwise, he might die in the battle and another man, oh, oh, sorry, and another man would begin to use its fruit. Verse seven, who is the man that is engaged to a woman and has not married her? Let him depart and return to his house. Otherwise, he might die in the battle and another man would marry her. And then, the officers, so these are three um, outs. You, um, you've built a new house, you've planted a new vineyard, you're engaged to be married. But then verse 8 is sort of a catch-all. Um, the officers shall speak further to the people and say, who is the man that is afraid and faint-hearted? Let him depart and return to his house so that he might not make his brother's heart melt like his heart. Now, not everybody handles conflict uh, or potential conflict in the same way, but you can imagine it would be very hard to go into battle when you can't trust the guy beside you that he's got your back. If you are going ahead, you're striving, you're fighting, you're, you're doing it, but and someone is coming from an angle and you can't see them. Well, you want your buddy who's beside you on whichever side to see and and protect you. But if he's faint-hearted and he's afraid, you're not going to get that. So uh, these were some things that needed to be engaged in on Israel's side before they went into battle. Now, here are a couple of things as far as the enemy side is concerned that you may not have um, thought of. Verse 10, Deuteronomy 20, 10. When you approach a city to fight against it, you shall offer it terms of peace. So this is, is the way God would send uh, people. But first and foremost, Offer them peace. If they uh, want to settle without war, fine. Um, now, <laughs> in verse 11, if it agrees to make peace with you and opens to you, all the people who are found in that city shall become your forced labor and shall serve you. So, but you think what is better for all of us to die or for us to become? servants of Israel. And so so there, there, there is something for us to for them to, to think about there. It, it was a matter that that um, they could have terms for peace before the battle begun. Now if they didn't choose peace, if they didn't choose um, you know, knowing the consequences to become laborers for uh, Israel, then you progress to the next stage. Um, I, and I probably should read this whole section because it's it's so critical to our understanding of, of things that we have read before and will read going forward. Verse ten, of course, offer peace. Uh, verse eleven. They would become forced labor. Uh, verse 12, however, if it does not make peace with you, but makes war against you, then you shall besiege it. Uh, when the Lord your God gives it into your hand, you shall strike all the men in it with the edge of the sword. Only the woman and the children and the animals and all that is in the city, all its spoil, you shall take as booty for yourselves. 
uh, you shall use the spoil of your enemies, which the Lord your God has given you. Thus you shall do to all the cities that are very far from you, which are not the cities of those nations nearby. Only in the cities of these people that the Lord your God is giving you as, inher as an inheritance, you shall not leave alive anything that breathes. So God is giving you a particular city. Um, they have not chosen offers of peace and, and to become your laborers. Uh, but if this is one of the cities that you are receiving as a part of my promise uh, to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and, and certainly through Moses also, you shall... Now, verse 17, you shall utterly destroy them. The Hittite, the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Perizzite, uh, the Jebusite, as the Lord your God has commanded you. And, and this is, again, what a lot of people um, sort of can't handle. The, the whole aspect of going to war and and killing everybody in that particular city and verse 18 says from god's perspective this is the reason why you destroy them all so that they may not teach you to do according to all their detestable things which they have done for their gods so that you would sin against the lord your god so so he's saying these nations have established wicked religions. They have established wicked uh, practices by virtue of which they will do even things like burning their own children to Molech. So when I give you victory over these people, you destroy them completely so that they may not teach you to do according to all the detestable things which they have done for their gods, so that you would sin against the Lord your God. So that's the justification uh, of Scripture that the Lord gave to Moses to say, this is why you destroy all the nations that are... are um, before before you uh, when i tell you this city or this country is a part of your inheritance everything that lives there will be destroyed so that is chapter 20 and i i think i will pause here i don't think i will go any further than that just now um just some time for some questions and comments that you may have as we have gone through tonight's lesson uh rainford family hi pastor i um okay. would just like some clarification in regards to slavery so hebrew slaves could eventually be freed however a foreign slave are they permanent permanently a slave or could they also be free um so hebrew slaves definitely six years was the the max and in the seventh year they were free with a reward um and and blessings um i'm just i'm trying to remember off the top of my head whether in the year of jubilee all slaves were freed and I would, if someone quickly can remember the scripture that speaks about the uh, 50th year, the Jubilee, where we read that, um, I will, uh, that will probably give us the answer about all slaves. So Leviticus 25? Leviticus 25. 
Thank you very much. Um, 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 um. So, what verse now? Yeah, I'm asking. Uh, for verse 11, time. Pastor. Verse 11, thank you. Leviticus 25, 11. Okay, let's start at uh, 10. Um, you shall thus consecrate the 50th year and proclaim a release through the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you, and each of you shall return to his own property, and each of you shall return to his family. You shall have the 50th year as a jubilee. You shall not sow, nor reap its aftergrowth, nor gather it from its untrimmed um, vines, for it is a jubilee. It shall be holy to you. You shall eat its crops out of the field. Now, um, th this, this goes back, you know, when I was talking about the seven-year period, as I say, there are times that Jews would split their field in seven and sort of keep cycling through. But this 50th year, everything would uh, shut down. Uh, and in verse 13, everyone re would return to their own property. So it's whatever would grow spontaneously out of the field, that was fine. But there would be no planting, cultivating, and reaping. Now, uh, in verse 14, if you make a sale, moreover, to your friend or buy from your friend's hand, you shall not do wrong. You shall not wrong it, one another. Um, I think it jumps definitely. down to chapter to verse 35 and beyond. Okay. 35. Now, in the case a countryman of yours becomes poor and uh, his means with regard to you falter, then you are to sustain him like a stranger or a sojourner. Don't take user's interest from him. Uh, verse 37 shall not give him your silver and interest. Um, verse 39, if he sells himself to you, uh, verse 40, he shall serve with you until the year of Jubilee. Um, he shall go out uh, from you, he and his sons with him, and shall go back to his family, that he may return to the property of his forefathers. So uh, this seems... Well, uh, keeps going. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna, I, I was just thinking about this whole thing of when you go in uh, with a wife, and it would seem here, wife, sons, whatever, they may return. But this is, of course, a, a blanket for all the, the Hebrews. Uh, now, verse 42 they are my servants whom I brought out from the land of Egypt. They are not to be sold in a slave trade. Um, um now verse 44 as for your male and female slaves whom you may have you may acquire male and female slaves from the pagan nations that are around you then too it is out of the sons of the sojourners who live as aliens among you uh, that you may gain acquisition and out of their families who are with you uh, whom they will have produced in your land, they also may become your possession. You may even bequeath them to your sons after you uh, to receive as a possession. You can use them as permanent slaves. But in respect to your countrymen, the sons of Israel, you shall not rule with severity over one another. So, so yes, slaves from other lands can be kept as and their children as a permanent possession even passed down from one generation to the next but hebrew slaves would be for no longer than um six years and released in the seventh thank you very much for that question sister frederica that's thank you for the answer <laughs> hey, no problem Okay. Anything else? 
um, regarding that, why do people think that um, it was like arbitrary three years or arbitrary seven years, especially in light of the year of Jubilee, which seemed to be a Sabbath of Sabbaths. So like, it seems that everybody had the same seven years and then seven years and then on this Sabbath of the seventh, seventh year, that was the year of Jubilee. So why, why do people think that, um, you know, one person might have chosen these three years or started here and then, or somebody else might have started their seven years at this point. And I'm just, I've never heard of that before yeah. tonight. Um, yeah, so it, it, it was a matter of, um, there, there is, and we read this in Exodus, that um, I wouldn't be able to put my finger on it, but you, well, just the, the, the same principle as the Sabbath day. Uh, they would collect uh, twice as much on the, on the um, sixth day, and it would last them for the, the seventh day. And the same principle would apply for the land. But, um, and again, this is just um, commentators and historians writing of the fact that some would say, well, you know what? I mean, the, the, the year of Jubilee was just across the board, but others would try to interpret the law in such a way Let's say you divide your land into seven. One portion has to be fallow in year one, but then you could basically have six sevenths of your land producing at all times. That was the the um, the way some people found to sort of work around that. As uh, I think we've seen in scripture that the Israelites were quite inventive in some of the things they would do to try to circumvent the law. Uh, I mean, to this day, um, uh, someone was telling, uh, the rabbi was telling me about Montreal, where there's, of course, it's probably the same in Toronto, but he just mentioned uh, living there. And uh, a Sabbath day's journey, you know, was kind of set out as a specified uh, distance, but some people would want to go maybe a little further. Anything you did in your home, you could walk around your home. So they would actually attach uh, a cord from one home to the next home. And because they were attached, it now became one home. So they could walk from one home to the next because they were attached from that one to the next door, wherever, you know, things that people would do just trying to circumvent the rigidity of of the law and of course their justification would be well you know um like the daughters of zalofa had there are times you you have to look for the spirit of the law not just the letter of the law and in fact although they don't believe in jesus uh, for the most part, this is exactly what Jesus was teaching and what Paul highlights in Romans, that you are looking for the spirit of the law more so than the letter of the law. And so they came up with some very interesting accommodations. But clearly it's saying here, the um, year of Jubilee, everything shuts down. Everyone's released. Um, if you have land that you purchased from a fellow Israelite, it's going back to its original owner. And that, again, would be a reason why they would not cultivate that field or plant that field, knowing that it's going back. Uh, now you're sending it back to its original owner with all this produce on it, which was very valuable. So, God willing, we will start on chapter 21 the next time, and that takes us 
Well, I think we did a fairly uh, good job tonight, got from chapter 11 to chapter 20. And again, just continue reading ahead that um, you may have questions if there's something that comes up that you would like to discuss. And so God be with you until we meet again.